Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program featuring reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is sponsored by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Rick Kravenka for the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. We will also hear more about the life of St. Joseph the Worker and the readings for this second Sunday in Ordinary Time, Divine Mercy Sunday. That and more on Wineskins. Catholic Charities is an important part of the life of the Church and the entire population. To share some pertinent topic with us is Nicole Beringer. A faithful journey. Pray, donate, volunteer. Bishop Murray is asking everyone to participate in this year's annual Bishop's Appeal. He is asking all diocesan families to join us, engage with us, and to participate in this very important annual appeal by completing a participation card and returning it. The definition of participate is simple. It means to take part. But is seeking participation as simple as the definition? There are approximately 65,000 registered Catholic households within our diocese. However, last year, the participation rate for the Bishop's Appeal was 26% of our diocesan households. That amounts to slightly over 17,000 participating in the Bishop's Appeal. We must engage the other 74% of registered Catholic households if our diocese is to sustain all of our important ministries. We need every household to join us. Consider our diocese without enough funding to sustain all of our ministries. What would we look like without all of the radio and television programming provided by CTNY? Without all of the faith formation courses provided by the Office of Religious Education? Without the efforts of our Office of Evangelization? or without enough funds to serve all who seek our assistance? What if Catholic Charities agencies throughout our diocese had to limit the amount of services provided to clients in need? Even more families would go without food, shelter, and other basic needs. The goal of this appeal is to have 100% participation from our diocesan family. However, there is also a financial need. We need to raise $4.2 million to sustain our programs and ministries throughout the diocese. The diocese exists to provide food for the hungry, shelter for the homeless, opportunities to deepen and strengthen our faith, and for our youth to live as committed disciples in a challenging world. Bishop Murray is asking for support of the appeal by encouraging people to participate in three ways. Pray, donate, and or volunteer. We can pray for solutions. We can make time to pray about the difficulties many within our diocese face and for the ministries that exist to alleviate these issues. Prayer can open our eyes to our responsibilities and our hearts to solutions. Millions of people throughout the United States and the world are struggling. We can pray that God will enlighten us as to how we can best assist those in need. We can spread the word about our ministries within our faith communities and give some time or resources by volunteering at a local parish or other diocesan ministry. It takes all of us working together to make a change. Finally, donate to the annual Bishop's Appeal. To make financial contribution, visit our website or mail a check along with the response card you might have already received. If a response card is needed, envelopes are available in the pews at all parishes. All three of these actions truly make a difference. Visit our website to read real stories about people living in poverty and how supporting the appeal provides help and hope to those in need. Get information about ministries provided throughout our communities and neighborhoods. Understand the importance of these ministries and how being available to serve people is a true calling to our church. At this time of year, as we celebrate the Easter season, We remember the sacrifices that Jesus made for us. Please consider sharing your blessings with others by participating in the annual Bishop's Appeal. We are truly grateful for our entire diocesan family and thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to provide help to our brothers and sisters in need. 
Without you, we would not be able to provide all of the ministries within our diocese that offer a lifeline to those who need it the most. We are also thankful for the work we do, for the dedication of our staff members and volunteers, for our parishes, and for all involved in the programs and services we offer to those we serve in the name of the Church. Get stories of help and hope, as well as information about participating in the annual Bishop's Appeal on our website, www.ccdoy.org. Sign up to receive our semi-annual publications and follow us on our social media pages. Please join us as we pray, donate, and volunteer to ensure the well-being of others. Be assured of our prayers to you and your families as we share the joy of this Easter season. For Wineskins, I am Nicole Beringer. The Feast of St. Joseph the Worker is celebrated on May 1st. To tell us more about this feast is Martha Coulter. She is from St. Jude Church in Columbiana. May Day has long been dedicated to labor and the working person. The feast in honor of St. Joseph the Worker was instituted by Pope Pius XII in 1955. It falls on the first day of the month that is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Pope Pius XII expressed the hope that this feast would accentuate the dignity of labor and would bring a spiritual dimension to labor unions. It is eminently fitting that St. Joseph, a working man who became the foster father of Christ and the patron of the Universal Church, should be honored on this day. The text of the Mass and the Liturgy of Hours provide a catechetical synthesis of the significance of human labor seen in the light of faith. The opening prayer states that God, the creator and ruler of the universe, has called men and women in every age to develop and use their talents for the good of others. The Office of Readings, taken from the document of the Second Vatican Council on the Church in the Modern World, develops this idea. In every type of labor, we are obeying the commandment of God given in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 15, and repeated in the responsory for the Office of Readings. The responsory for the Canticle of Zechariah says that, St. Joseph faithfully practiced the carpenter's trade. He is a shining example for all workers. Then, in the second part of the opening prayer, we ask that we may do the work that God has asked of us and come to the rewards He has promised. In the prayer after communion, we ask, May our lives manifest your love. May we rejoice forever in your peace. The liturgy for this feast vindicates the right to work, and this is the message that needs to be heeded in our modern society. In many of the documents issued by Pope St. John XXIII, Blessed Pope Paul VI, the Second Vatican Council, and St. John Paul II, reference is made to the Christian spirit that should permeate one's work after the example of St. Joseph. In addition to this, there is a special dignity and value to the work done in caring for the family. The Office of Readings contain an excerpt from the Vatican II document on the Church in the Modern World where men and women in the course of gaining a livelihood for themselves and their families offer appropriate service to society, they can be confident that their personal efforts promote the work of the Creator, confer benefits on their fellow men, and help to realize God's plan in history. The preface of the Mass reads, Father, in your provident love you have chosen Saint Joseph to be the custodian of your Son made man to surround him with fatherly love and to give us an example of working for a livelihood. Though a descendant of the royal stock of David, he earned his daily bread by the sweat of his brow. Encouraged and consoled by living with Jesus and Mary, he ennobled human toil, practicing his trade with zeal and remarkable virtue. He became the teacher of work to Christ the Lord who did not disdain to be called the son of a carpenter. For Wineskins, I'm Martha Coulter. I'm talking with Rick Krivenka from the Diocese of Cleveland. What I'd like us to talk about, Rick, is when you were in the pastoral planning office with the diocese, you shared some of your expertise with us here in the Diocese of Youngstown. I'd like you to 
kind of give us a little background as to what brought that on and how you really enriched our parishes with your presence. Well, yeah, it was a tremendous honor to be invited. I think one of my first contacts, I began as director of pastoral planning in Cleveland in 1979. And I think it was in the early 1990s, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with you and you were pastor at Immaculate mm -hmm. Conception and then Tom Eisworth was at Sacred Heart and Ed Noga at St. Patrick's. Mm -hmm. And I think you were realizing something that we felt was so important is that we're better together when mm -hmm. we learn to realize we're one church together. We're not simply isolated in sometimes mm -hmm. competitive communities. I think one of the challenges in Catholic life is sometimes parishes grew up and it was almost a competition who's bigger sure. and better with certain sports teams or certain activities. Mm -hmm. But what we always have to remember, and this was something I find very inspiring. I heard a talk by a, a precious blood father, Father Clarence Williams, a number of years ago. And he made a comment. He said, Jesus taught us to pray the Our Father. We always think of that, you know, the Lord's Prayer. But he said, that was not Jesus' prayer. Jesus' prayer in the Gospel of John was, Father, that they may be one, as you and I are one. And I've often seen that as people were to say, what, what, what's pastoral planning about? It's responding to Jesus' prayer that mm -hmm. we might be one mm -hmm. as God wants us to be one. I think the, the whole movement of Jesus coming into the world is the unity of all creation, mm -hmm. of all people. And I think there's a lot of forces at work that are working mm -hmm. at times against that. But we obviously have to remember that's Jesus' prayer, our unity. So when we begin to come together, we grow a little more into that unity, whether it's two mm -hmm. or three parishes or more parishes on a deanery level, whatever we're more recognizing that we're interdependent mm -hmm. with each other. And we have to look at what's the bigger world we collectively take care of rather mm -hmm. than your place versus my place. And so I remember when we had those conversations, it grew out of an experience we were having in Cleveland. We had a major pastoral planning effort in the 1980s called the urban region mm -hmm. planning process, specifically about Cleveland at the time. And we saw the tremendous demographic changes, mm -hmm. very parallel to what happened in the city of Youngstown and other cities mm -hmm. with out-migration, fewer resources. And, and one of the things we created as a way of looking at things back in the 80s mm -hmm. is the importance of clusters, right. that we need to work together to talk about how can we better share resources. Every parish doesn't have to have one of everything. Mm -hmm. And what many people don't realize today and some of the biggest dioceses in the country, you know, for example, Boston, and I think Pittsburgh is moving into this, mm -hmm. they're actually creating a parish cluster as a parish where a pastor has multiple parish sites, but they all work together as one team with, mm -hmm. there might be a parochial vicar, other staff members, but that is now the leading edge mm -hmm. of where people realize we need to go. And, yeah. and so you were very prophetic, <laughs> you and Ed and Tom, mm -hmm. realizing, wow, we we've got to come together and, and find a better way to be the church. And I think we've seen the fruits of that here in the Diocese of Youngstown. I think we still obviously have a ways to go. And like any kind of process, it does take time. It takes energy. It yes. takes commitment and dedication to that. What would you say to those parishes that have a need to be more parochial, to be more on their own instead of looking at the bigger picture and being part of the broader, wider community, which is church. On one hand, I'm gonna share a personal thing. I became a grandparent for the first time, my wife and I, Barbara, with our granddaughter, Amelia, our first grandchild, mm -hmm. born in Colorado Springs and on April 21st. And so it got me thinking, I have four young adult children. And I, I was thinking to myself about, the, you know, the journey of raising from infant into childhood and our mm -hmm. own children. And one of the first things you teach your children, even at the youngest of ages, is you need to learn to share the world. I mean, that, that's what family life is. It's not just what I want. It's I, I need to be aware of what is my world and how do I share what I have with it. And so I, I think there, on one hand, even from a, a human standpoint, aside from a church standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, we're called to be aware of what is the world that I'm a part of, you know, the bigger community, mm -hmm. and how do I learn to share what I have with those in need to simply grow even more into that image I shared of Father that that they may be one, mm -hmm. as you and I are one. And so this isn't something we do because we're running out of resources or because we're desperate. That's what God calls us to. Mm -hmm. That's what we teach our children. Mm -hmm. You know, we teach our children to learn on one hand to share within a family and then in the wider world when they meet other children. And so it's part of what it means to be the best of what it means to be human as well as Christian and Catholic. And it's a mindset. You know, I think right. it's important to realize I'm here for others. We, we have a wonderful image in the Jesuit tradition. It's often that first Father Pedro Arupe, I think, first shared this image and then it grew in different other ways. But we are men and women for others, mm -hmm. for others, mm -hmm. not just for me or not just for my own. Mm -hmm. And we have to be thinking, what are the others 
God is calling me to in this time, mm -hmm. in my neighborhood, in my area. It's always a call outward. Right. Jesus said, go and make disciples. He didn't say, go and make clubs. Mm -hmm. Go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Go out into the world. So we have to keep translating. What does that mean for us in our area? That's a discernment mm -hmm. that I think people have to figure out. We need to do that with our other Catholic partners as well as partners of other Christian denominations right. and faiths. So it's, a, it's an ever-widening circle. Right. That's what we are called to. How and why is parish life changing? Because it really is changing. In a nutshell, why sure. is that? Well, I think one of the most pivotal changes that is a great concern to me, and I would often say one of the greatest pastoral challenges we now face are young adults. Mm. Because what mm. we're seeing, whether the young adults are from the absolute best of Catholic families, their parents truly did practice their faith in the mm -hmm. best ways. They were loving parents, the nieces and nephews of priests and religious. I think what countless people are seeing is a disengagement, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of marriages that are celebrated outside the church, not necessarily a choice to baptize children. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not because they didn't have great models. And I think that's a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. They're still wonderful young adults. I think they have great values. They have great care for the world. But I think we need to do everything we can to engage mm -hmm. in a caring and kind mm -hmm. and inviting manner every young adult we can to stay in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just better understanding where they are right. and not in any way being negative or overly judgmental. But mm -hmm. if, you, if you think about what's gonna happen in 15, 20, 30 years from now, mm -hmm. what will parish life look like yeah. without more young adults and young families coming into the church? I mean, it's a very challenging thought. To receive more information on that and other issues and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hello, I'm Bishop George Murray. As we begin our annual Bishop's Appeal in the Diocese of Youngstown, I am reminded of the many church ministries supported by our efforts. Through our goal of $4.2 million, we can continue to do the work of Catholic charities and evangelization provide quality education and ministry to our seminarians, youth, and young adults, offer pastoral services to our sisters and brothers through the Office of Hispanic Ministry, promote pro-life activities, and even share the faith through radio and television in our telecommunications efforts. Please join us through your prayer, financial contributions, or volunteerism to achieve our goal in this year. This is Bishop George Murray of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Christ's resurrection offers a promise of renewed life within us. I encourage you to go out and spread the good news that Christ is risen and glorify the Lord with your life. For the same Lord who has sacrificed his only son for us sends us out today. Let us give thanks and celebrate his abundant life this Easter season. Our song today is by Don Chapman. It is from his CD entitled, Hymns of Ivory.
Our scripture reflections for this second Sunday of Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday, will be by Sister Regina Rogers. She is an Ursuline sister of Youngstown. On this, the second Sunday of Easter, we continue the experience of contradictions. Both last Sunday, Easter Sunday, and this Sunday, we notice that the resurrection event is filled with contrasts. There seems to be a play between doubt and belief, between a sense of loss and fear and a static joy. The disciples are locked in a room because they are afraid that the crowd who crucified Jesus will come after them. Jesus, in his resurrected body, stands in their midst and says, Peace be with you. We have the human bodies of the disciples and the glorified body of Christ. We have the disciples shaking in fear and Jesus offering peace and joy. We have the disciples hiding and Jesus commanding them to go out. These contradictions are embodied in the person of Thomas, who was not present. He expresses his doubt about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He wants to see tangible proof that Jesus has been raised, and that proof will only come if he can touch the nail marks in Jesus' body. Thomas is a convenient stand-in for all of us as we struggle to deepen our belief in the resurrected Christ. In the contradiction of belief and unbelief, the remarkable thing is that there is always room for both. Like mystery itself, belief isn't something we have, and that's the end of it. We grow and deepen our faith through the ups and downs of life. We call Thomas Doubting Thomas, and so he was. Truth be told, so are all of us. There are times in our lives when we simply are overcome by emptiness and absence, perhaps the death of a loved one, the painful illness of a friend, or the loss of a job. At these times, doubt and unbelief are natural. This doesn't mean we have lost our faith. It means that doubt can be a metaphor for dying. We know the experience of going to a dark place, a tomb, or an upper room, of feeling abandoned, of thinking that nothing makes sense, that life is not fair. We might even ask the question, is this all there is? But like Thomas, we can come to profound belief. We can see and hear and experience the risen Lord if we are open to God working in and through us. It is our choice whether to wallow in unbelief, to want tangible proof, to want the sickness to disappear or the dead to come back to life, or a blessing to fall into our laps, or a miracle pill to take away all sadness and pain. We can get caught up in the trap that it is only when good things happen that God is really present. So we strive to make real the common saying that seeing is believing. But today's gospel reading tells us to what our belief is directed to Jesus and new life found within. Rather than touching Jesus, as he had said he needed to do, Thomas sees the risen Christ and then utters a profound profession of faith. He needs no physical proof. He did not have to touch Jesus. Encounter with the risen Lord replaces the need for tangible evidence and opens up the space for deeper belief, for salvation. For us, it is not seeing that leads to believing, but believing that leads to seeing. Then, like Thomas, we can say, My Lord and my God. For Wineskins, I'm Sister Regina Rogers. Thomas the Doubter, 
wanted to know the truth about his Lord. At first he said that he would never believe. Once he saw, he believed that he was seeing his Lord and God in Jesus. He committed his life to the risen Lord. May we do the same. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a blessed Sunday and a safe week. Hello, I am Bishop George Murray. There are thousands of stories that I could share with you through our Catholic Charities agencies over the years. For example, there are elderly who are helped through prescription drugs. Young families are assisted with food and diapers. Countless lives are transformed and empowered to live with dignity and purpose. Your gift of money makes it possible to provide the many services shared through our annual appeal efforts. This year, we are also encouraging our Catholic faithful to consider volunteering their time and talent to celebrate the work of charities in our diocese. Won't you consider helping us this year?